The way Israel is colonizing Palestine brings eerie similarity to the way Native American tribes were colonized by the United States. Both Native Americans and Palestinians are linked in a particularly American sense. Both have been stereotyped in film, and both have been labeled uncivilized by the colonizing religion and government, which is just a pathetic excuse to take land and resources. Both Israel and the United States began with conquest and with the goal of possessing and colonizing already inhabited lands. To cleanse the land of its native inhabitants. Both histories reveal trails of deception, broken promises, and indigenous populations pushed to the margins of society by the colonizers. The language of force, the rhetoric of justification, and push for colonial violence used are strikingly similar. Israel and the United States are obvious historical colonial imperialist. Both, for example, have portrayed their brutal colonization projects as settlement and the colonizers as pioneers and settlers. The United States has backed Israeli settler colonialism ever since 1947, when the United Nations, the United Kingdom, and the United States began to open up settlements with a two-state solution. The ideal was to bring peace and a home to both the Palestinians and Jewish people. But the solution has since turned into an imperialist colonial state to push out, steal land, and commit ethnic cleansing targeting the Palestinians. The United States has historically backed, trained, and funded Israeli settler colonialism. Since the 1950s, there have been various CIA and State Department colonial imperialists such as Henry Kissinger, who were the orchestrators of proxy wars, coup d'etats and colonial destabilizing missions that targeted several Middle Eastern countries for U.S. and Western interests. These CIA and State Department missions also included isolating the Palestinians from their ancestral homelands to make room for Israeli settlement. President Obama, who once ran as an anti-war presidential candidate, spoke of working with the UN in establishing a two-state solution to bring peace. But as president, he caved in right away to Zionist and U.S. oligarchy pressure. He gave Israel tens of billions in military aid. Condoleezza Rice, who was President Obama's national security advisor, said the 10-year $38 billion military aid package to Israel was the single largest pledge of military assistance to any country in American history. You can understand that there is also a growing alliance with non-Indigenous communities who are seeing value um, in, in Indigenous um, uh, rights and specifically treaty rights. Um, and to me, that is the most hopeful sort of sign of this current resistance movement, is that Indigenous rights are at the forefront because they protect everybody's rights. Nick Estes, you focus on seven historical moments of resistance in your new book, Our History is the Future. Uh, you say they form a historical roadmap for collective liberation. How did you choose these histories? Just quickly take us through them. Sure. So I begin. Um, at the camps, I begin in the present, you know, um, at Standing Rock, and then I go to the fur trade with um, the first U.S. invasion, um, which was uh, Lewis and Clark who came through, who trespassed through our territory and were stopped by um, our, our leadership. And then I go through um, the, the, the Indian Wars of the 19th century and the Buffalo Genocide. Um, and then I go into um, talking about the um, the damming of the Missouri River in the mid 20th century, and then looking at red power in the in the 1960s and the 1970s, and how um, all of these indigenous people who were relocated because their lands were flooded um, by these dams eventually found themselves and created sort of the modern indigenous. Um, um, movement known as Red Power, and then looking, going back and ending actually at Standing Rock in 1974 with the creation of the International Indian Treaty Council, which really coalesced um, these generations of, of, an, of indigenous resistance and took the um, treaties, the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, to the world um, and to the United Nations. And to do that, they looked to um, Palestinians. Um, they looked to the South African anti-apartheid movement, who provided the mechanisms for recognition of, of indigenous rights at the United Nations. And that all resulted um, over four decades in the touchstone document, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was passed by the UN in 
2007. And so in many ways, when we look at Standing Rock and we look at, we go down Flag Row and we see the hundreds of tribal nation flags that were represented in 2016 and 2017, we also saw the Palestinian flag that was there, kind of hearkening back to that that um, that's that international solidarity with uh, movements of the global south and specifically um, our Palestinian relatives who, you know, um, today are still facing, much like us, are still facing the, the brunt and the brutality of um, settler colonialism, whether it's the, the, you know, the United States recogni recognizing the annexation of the Golan Heights or whether it's, you know, here in, in North America and the continued dispossession of indigenous territory and rights, we can see that settler colonialism in, in Israel or in Palestine is, an, is really an extension of settler colonialism in North America. Um, and so and then I end, you know, um, um, with uh, back at the camps and looking at how these camps really provided, you know, I actually look at a physical map that was handed out to um, um, water protectors who came to the camp. And on that map, there was, you know, where to find food, where to find um, the clinics, right? And where to find um, the security and the all the camps that were represented at the um, at, at Standing Rock. Um, and to me, that provided, you know, a kind of interesting parallel to um, the world that surrounded the camps, which was 90, you know, some 92 different law enforcement jurisdictions. Um, you had the, the North Dakota National Guard, the world of cops, the world of um, the militarized sort of police state. Um, and in the camps themselves, you had sort of the, the primordial sort of beginnings of what a world premised on indigenous justice might look like. And in that world, you know, everyone got free food. There was a place for everyone. You but then also um, there was health clinics um, to provide health care, alternative forms of health care to everyone. And so if we look at that, it's housing, education, um, all for free, right? Uh, a strong sense of community. And for a short time, there was free education at the camps, right? Those are things that most poor communities in the United States don't have access to, and especially reservation communities. But given the opportunity to create a new world, um, in that camp centered on uh, indigenous justice and treaty rights, um, society organized itself according to need and not to profit. And so where there was, you know, the world of settlers, uh, settler colonialism that surrounded us, there was the world of indigenous justice um, that existed for a brief moment in time. And in that world, instead of doing to um, settler society what they did to us, genociding, removing, excluding, we, there's a capaciousness to indigenous resistance movements that welcomes in non-indigenous peoples into our struggle because that's our primary strength is one of relationality, one of making kin, right? Nick Estes, assistant professor of American studies at the University of New Mexico, author of the new book, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance. He's co-founder of the indigenous resistance group The Red Nation and a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe. Native American and Palestinian activists have historically been in solidarity with each other's movements. Please support Native American land-back movements and a Palestinian two-state solution.